upon realizing that Snow White is still alive, the queen sends to kill her three times. And on the third time, she asks the mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? And the mirror responds, you are my queen, affirming what she had previously thought before Snow White had came, that she was the most beautiful. Um, after this, Snow White is luckily brought back to life after a prince comes in and sees her like this. And the prince says, oh my gosh, I'll pay anything for her. And the prince does in fact eventually convince the doors to let Snow White be in the care of the prince. Now the prince, on the way back home to his kingdom with Snow White's body, stumbles upon some stones. And upon stumbling upon some stones with the body, Snow White actually coughs up the poisonous apple that she had bitten into that the queen had tried to poison her with. And upon coughing it up, she comes back to life. And it is from here that Snow White and the prince get married. And the evil queen, in attending this marriage, is held down with iron boots and is killed because she's an evil queen. Let's open with Freud. To start with the beginning of the story, it is arguable that if the opening scene were a dream, three drops of blood that drop after... Now let's do it again. To start with the beginning of the story, it is arguable that if the opening scene were a dream, finger pricking, pricking that results in three drops of blood into snow and later on a conception of a child is the manifest content. Whereas the latent content is the act between king and the queen resulting in conception of Snow White. Furthermore, we see all three structures of personality. Superego is represented by Snow's mother. When she pricks her finger and drops blood, she doesn't give in to pain, as that would be unbecoming of a queen. Instead, she dignifiedly acknowledges the blood in a different way. Ego is represented only by the dwarves. They go to work every day, all day, and dictate most rules around the house. However, when they first see Snow White asleep in their beds, they do not wish to wake her up or reject her just because he's beautiful and thus they give in to their feelings at the time. Finally, Snow White, Evil Queen, and the Prince are ruled by the id. Evil Queen indulges her um, urges to harm Snow White so that no one would be more beautiful. Snow White gives in to her curiosity and lets a strange woman in all three times, although she knows that's wrong. And the Prince sees the Snow White seemingly dead in a coffin for the first time in his life. Yet, he insists to take her with him because he feels like he loves her and can't live without her. Moreover, two defense mechanisms are notable, both uh, utilized by the evil queen. Acting out is evident uh, in all of her attempts to harm Snow White, and projection is evident in her fear of Snow White taking her place in the world, although she is in fact the one that took uh, the... Moreover, two defense mechanisms are notable both utilized by the evil queen. Acting out is evident in her in all of her attempts to harm Snow White. And projection is evident in her fear of Snow White taking her place in the world, although she is in fact the one trying to, uh, well, that has already taken the old queen's place and now trying to get rid of Snow White. Finally, both life and death, death instincts are uh, presented throughout the book. Life instinct is depicted by Snow White's grasp for survival and also her curiosity to try the apple and other good, the other goods that the lady is selling. And the death instinct uh, is represented by the evil queen, both in her attempt to harm Snow White and her readiness to harm herself if she does not survive. Now taking a look at the Jungian perspective, this story, uh, we all take note to the fact that Carl Jung had a concept called the collective unconscious. Now, the collective unconscious was believed to be structures of the unconscious mind that are shared among beings of the same species. Also, it is important to note that each individual part of the collective unconscious can be broken down into different archetypes. Now, these archetypes, as we'll come to know, are primordial image in the collective unconscious. They're in any pattern, as you will, 
that influences experience of the real world. Uh, it's almost innumerable, if you will, due to the variations in life experiences. Now, going into the certain archetypes presented in the book, specifically with the queen that is the first character in the book pricking her finger, we have the characteristic and archetype of a mother. Uh, the mother is nurturing and comforting, and she's needed for the existence of life in humans. Um, in the story of Snow White, we see the mother as someone who pricks her thumb or her finger and is trying to get this child and says, I wish I could have a child. And upon giving birth to the child, dies. But before dying, makes sure that that child is born. So we see that full essence of a mother in the queen that is at the beginning of the story. Now we see in the king, who is the father of Snow White, the ruler. He's controlling, uh, power hungry, and his goal is to create a prosperous and successful family or community. Now, what that means within the story is that he's going to look and make actions towards making his kingdom the best. We see this with him getting married less than two years away, just a year after his wife's death. He's there getting remarried to another queen. And now we take a look at the child. The child is the innocent beginning of all humans, potential in its purest form. And this is what we believe Snow White, the innocent child to be. She is just that exact archetype, young and in no way looking to harm anything, but is purely just the potential that was created by her loving mother. As we go on to the innocent Snow White, which is the naive and saintly version of Snow White, her goal is to be happy. Now, I would say saintly only because of the pureness of this child who was conceived from a mother who died at giving birth to her. And after that is now known to be the fairest of them all in an entire kingdom by the true telling mirror. So she is saintly, if you will, and her naivety is in the fact that she lets her own evil queen stepmother into her house three times, despite being told by the dwarves, not let anybody into the house. I'm continuing, we also have from the side of the evil queen, the witch. She's dangerous in the fact that she is seeking to take the life of Snow White Queen. Now, the queen is also seen as the trickster in this story because she tricks Snow White on three separate occasions, one being with clothing, two being with a comb that is stuck in her hair, and three being with the apple that she deceives her with, all three times being very deceitful. And we see the queen being hidden in the story where she goes to a room in the kingdom that nobody ever visits. And it is in that dark, secretive, hidden room that she develops this poisonous apple that she uses to kill Snow White. So we know that the queen is both a witch and the trickster archetype. And then finally, we have the prince who is represented by the archetype of the hero. Um, he is the individual who pursues a great quest to realize his destiny. Now, this great quest is finding Snow White. He goes into the forest in search of Snow White upon hearing of her death. And upon finding her, sees that she is so beautiful that he must take her. It is now his new quest, newfound quest, to take this dead girl to his kingdom. Only because she is so beautiful and he would feel that his life not completes itself without having Snow White there. Now, upon taking Snow White, his quest is actualized and made accomplished when he stumbles upon some rocks and the piece of apple that was in Snow White's throat, causing her to die, pops out, Snow White comes back to life. In the end, we see the story come all full circle when the evil queen is killed by the clamp of the iron shoes on her feet and Snow White and the prince live happily ever after, thus the prince being the lovely hero in this story.